Um, Trevor, <laughs> I think most of you have met Trevor before. He um, yeah, he's written it all here. He's the father of three children. He's a retired hippie living in Jack Bay. He's a software developer. He's been involved in libertarianism since 1985 and attended all but one seminar. Co-developer of the Consent Axiom and recently inspired by Hayek, which is what he's going to talk to us about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Good morning. Well, I'm not a lawyer, so there'll probably be fewer words in this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't get paid for... I, I just get foster. <laughs> work. I'd also like to uh, preempt Francis's job and invite you to interact with me as we talk. It's not a terribly long presentation, and I'm certainly not an expert on Hayek, so if you have better insights as we go along, uh, please feel free to interrupt me and, and offer them. Wait, well. But you can sit there, John. What set of rules and laws should libertarians implement in order to create their own libertaria? Similar, perhaps, in, in concept to Colonia, we have a fairly clearly identified set of rules, laws, and laws that they apply. That is the, the question that I want to address today. It's a question I've addressed at length over the years as well, um, and certainly engaged with uh, many, uh, again, and amongst others. On the, on the question of what should our society look like if we had the option and the opportunity to, de to define it from scratch. At the gates of Libertaria, and yes it would have gates, <laughs> what set of questions would we ask you before we allowed you to, to come? Please. Sorry? Papers, please. <laughs> Well, the, we're lucky in the sense that Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, took even more time than I did to sit down and think about this uh, uh, problem. And he produced, amongst many other works, law, legislation, and liberty. And I more or less stumbled on it quite some time ago and uh, took it upon myself to read all 600 pages of it found it so elegant and so entertaining, really, that I took notes as I went along. And having put in that effort, I turned it into a, a document, and that's really this document here from which I will be referring in the process of the, the course of this talk. But Hayek refers to a concept which he calls the Great Society, similar to the Open Society that Popper refers to. I'd like to take this momentary opportunity to ask what do you think would be the contents of the Great Society? Does anybody want to offer short, brief descriptions of the Great Society? Particularly those who haven't read Hayek and can quote it verbatim. <laughs> but yeah, Gavin, just your, your, your... Well, the notion is abstract laws that are in, end independent. In other words, they don't presume any specific person or situation, but they're abstract laws, and if people can come and go, and as long as they apply those laws, integration happens optimally. Well, clearly has read Hayek. And with <laughs> my eidetic memory, I have exactly that right to hear some of that, 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 that definition. But in, in fact, I think he applies that more to the definition of the law. Um, the great society, a, a, a perfect society, we're the libertarians. We know the future. What do we think it should look like? The okay, Cape Republic. <laughs> <laughs> the point the is that we don't, Cape Republic. The point is that we don't know the future. That's Hayek's point. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> there's a society where, 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 where there's abstract and specific, any kind of specific activity is dealt with in an abstract way. So. Okay, look, let me tell you what Hayek says. The great society to which we should all aspire is a peaceful, free, and just society in which the chances of success 
of anyone selected at random are likely to be as great as possible. Mm. And I like that in, in the sense that um, no set of laws, rules, regulations, governments, anarchy, nothing about that. And I, I can't remember, and I don't know if anybody else did, it was I think a French philosopher who said that in order to create a society, we should never let the people who make the laws be the ones who implement them. Mm -hmm. They should always do this. And we would call it the separation of powers. But absolutely what he is saying is that we should be able to select anybody at random in a particular society and say that your chances of success are as good as anybody else's under whatever legal or other framework that we operate. And that really is, for me, the, the kind of society to which I aspire. But in fact, it's quite interesting, and the thing I loved about Hayek was that it was non-intuitive. As I read through it, I was sort of going, wow, I've always thought that, but I've always thought I was crazy to think that. <laughs> and some of the things that come out of it is, the great society is not designed. You cannot aim to achieve any particular foreseeable result. Perhaps coming back to the, the, the fact that you can't predict the future. So if you set up a society in which you believe you can predict the future, in which um, white people will be happy living in their own particular society, that's an attempt to predict the future. And you will impose rules on that future to try and accomplish that prediction. What he is saying is that great society cannot be designed. We aren't smart enough to do it. We don't have the wherewithal. We cannot, in fact, use our reason and logic to design out of the great society, to design a better society than the one we live. So what do we do? I'm sorry, are you saying that the only impediment to designing the great society is our intelligence? <laughs> Well, in fact, yes, I would say that that would be a fairly generic problem. It's if you have a lim limited intelligence, it limits everything you do, including your design of great societies. Uh, but not, not so much our intelligence, our, our, our ability to reason, our ability to understand the consequences of everything we do, our ability to predict the consequences of everything we do, is deeply limited. Deeply limited. And when you come with the assumption that if I simply apply scientific method, reason and logic, I will produce a great society. What you get is communism, okay, a, a, a system developed by reason, logic, and uh, uh, failed insight, really, I suppose. But you could argue that he's saying that you should specifically design something left alone. <laughs> You could specifically design something left alone. Well, well you know, yeah, yeah, that, 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 a rational decision not to interfere. Yes, it's a long way of saying that's a principle. Do less. That's a kind of design criteria. Yes, yes, I, I, I would agree with that as, as well. Is if you are going to take a reasoned decision, take a reasoned decision to do nothing or, or to do less. The, the other side of that is take take a reasoned decision to increase your intelligence or uh, as much as possible, as far as possible. Maybe, maybe it's not an insurmountable limit. I've been trying to do that for years. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> um, but, and I suspect that, uh, and he says, I mean, he's high. Who are you to argue with? <laughs> um, he says that basically there are limits to reason. Reason generally can only tell you what not to do. It will almost never tell you what you should do because there are too many options available to you. As, once again, Kevin referred to time as a vastly expanding um, set of options, but potentials, possibilities. And our life is a, a weaving through that set of, of possibilities. But it's a very interesting insight, and it's, given that most of us in here are logical reason thinkers, is that reason tells you what not to do. Do not step off the end of the pier. That, that's pretty reasonable. You're going to get wet. But when I turn back from the pier, what should I do to make the whole of the rest of my life and the whole of the rest of humanity's life better? Should I walk left or should I walk right? Or straight down the middle, throw bombs, etc., etc. What he says is the future is too big, too unpredictable to be subject to human understanding. So therefore, don't rely on reason and logic 
to get you into the future. Now, here is the, the key point. What do you rely on in that case? Yes. Computers. <laughs> they're, they're, they're kind of famous for their reason and logic. <laughs> well, I, think, I think he's saying you can't do that for the whole of society. Not that individuals can't do that for themselves and take their best chances of having a good outcome. Of course, you, you do apply your reason and logic, you know, should I go to lunch or should I go and roll about in the road? You, know, you kind of use your reason and logic to get you there. But in fact, to, to cut it short, well, what he says is that the basic order of the great society arises not from rational analysis, but through a spontaneous order. And I'm disappointed that all the free market enthusiasts in here didn't immediately spring to that answer, which is that in the event that our reason and logic fails, what would we rely on? Well, the same system that gets us into the market and allows us to trade and profit and so on and so forth. The spontaneous order of the market in terms of economics, and for me the great insight was that law arises from a spontaneous order as well. Yet once again, Gavin referred to that uh, very briefly in passing, was the idea that in fact the vast majority of law comes from our quick and immediate inter interactions. I mean, you know, the reason I'm standing here with clothes on is because of a kind of totally unwritten contract that this would be better for me and for you. Um, <laughs> did it have to be a two-coloured shirt? <laughs> so, what he recommends is that we rely on the spontaneous order, and there are many other spontaneous orders out there other than just the, the free market mechanism. Anybody like to suggest? No. <laughs> no fair, you read the exam, you, you, you're cheating on the results. But uh, let, let, let somebody ecology. else suggest a, a, a spontaneous order? Ecology. The ecology, nature, yes, precisely. You see, nature is a, a great um, language. Precisely. And and one one that last one. That's disgusting. Simply the mathematics. Essentially, everything is. Well, not everything, but a hell of a lot. Yes, arises through a spontaneous order which we didn't direct through our reason and logic. Um, the the other one that he mentions is morality. Uh, our morality arises generally not because we sat down and thought about it at great length, but because we've observed behaviors over many years, and the, the ones that work seem to be the ones that are moral, the ones that don't, and they are. Mm -hmm. but we're talking about what defines the great society. He, he had five criteria. One of, sorry, yeah. Yes. <laughs> One is that uh, you allow co coercion within the great society only if it is applied in the enforcement of universal rules of just conduct equally applicable to all. And, you know, just to re-emphasize that, universal rules, they must apply globally to the entire environment. They can't be selected, and they must apply equally to all citizens. And that, I suppose, was the source of my concern and ob objection, perhaps, to the Aronia constitution. The, they have these universal rules of just conduct, but they really only apply to particular citizens, of the common citizens. The rest are um, effectively excluded from, from their society. Just to emphasize, I'm absolutely good that Aronia could exist within a libertarian environment. Be perfectly happy for that to happen on their private property applying their private rules, whichever they, they like. But what concerns me today is in the environment around Aranya, on our greater space, what set of rules should we have there that would accommodate all the rest? The, the, the Muslims, the crazies, the, and the other South Africans. The question really is, and I addresses this, it's always a source of huge debate amongst uh, libertarians is, so you say that, but how, how does it get to be legitimate? From whence do you derive your legitimacy for what you're saying? And a lot of libertarians over the years have appealed to, to natural law, to pass governments, to the, the 
authority of kings, the authority of religions and God. All of these are potentials from which you can derive the legitimacy of what we're, we're trying to propose here. But very much as, as I've suggested in, in formulating the consent axiom, is that the great society de derives its legit legitimacy from a commitment to general principles approved by widespread opinion and applicable to all. Once again, to emphasize this, a commitment to general principles, not a vast body of rapidly changing law implemented by rational but weak and not, uh, not tremendously insightful men. He, he's talking about trying to isolate and, and, and uh, put down those general principles which would appeal to a majority of people within our society of libertarian. And one of the things we would say at the gate as you arrive is, are you committed to the following general principles which we, we will list and which are approved within our area by everybody you will encounter there? Are you prepared to commit yourself to those principles? Not just you, you would ask at your gate, are you an Afrikaner, do you self-identify as an Afrikaner? We would say, do you self-identify as a believer in these general principles? So I've covered the, the fact that the great society is undesigned, arises through a spontaneous order. The role of reason is limited within that society. But that's certainly one of the goals and objectives of the Great Society is the introduction, the imposition, not with no bad, bad word, but the growth of freedom and justice within this, this Great Society. This is a libertarian conference. Anybody want to suggest a definition for the word freedom or what freedom means to you? See, I'm keeping you awake. Um, I think the dog has an opinion. No, no, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> right, Jack. For I live and let live. Okay. So, do no harm. Yeah. I suggest the ability to identify who you are as an individual and have the right to live that out in connection with the people that you are, by whom you are surrounded. In Hayek's opinion, the best answer so far. Okay, I, I'll have to go with the consent axiom and I'm again horrified that it's the fourth thing. One hundred percent the best answer. Go to the top of the class. You, you may leave. <laughs> I cheated though. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah we, well we've been there. <laughs> According to Hayek, freedom is when you may use your partic particular knowledge and your particular property to accomplish your own particular purposes. Very close to, to, to what you're saying. What he's essentially saying is that nobody else gets to take your particular property, that, that which you have acquired, and we won't go into how you got it. Nobody else has your set of knowledge, experience, etc., etc. And you're entitled in a free society to use that to accomplish your particular purposes. Does that, does, this, does that resonate at all? Mm. It still has to be read with what John said. You can't do it in a way, you can't accomplish your particular purposes at the expense of oh, other people's particular yeah. purposes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Honestly, it's not a paid plot. <laughs> <laughs> to a certain extent, the, the, uh, the whole idea of a great society is, is a bit wobbly. In as much as for me, a great society is continually emerging. Because if you go back to the individual trying to achieve her um, existential ends, those are changing, and any consensus which develops must be from individuals who are constantly changing, and therefore the way they interact with each other and develop norms are also changing. Mm. I totally agree with you, but we're getting better at it over time, and I believe we can get better at it in, into the future. Um, so we, we started out as, you know, I, I like that goat that you killed, I kill you, now, now it's mine. Okay? That, that's a, a, a bad system for getting to the great society. Okay, so that didn't work. I'll tell you what, let's put a chief in place. Okay, and he can decide whether I can kill you. And that, that had flaws. We put a king in place, and that had flaws. 
we then got this brilliant idea of ask everybody in the room and what more than half of them say, they, they could say, well, I can kill you for your gut. And we called that democracy. And that's still not a, a very good idea at all. So yes, we are evolving forward, and I would like to think that libertarians have evolved forward further than they most. And <laughs> Hayek is probably out at the front leading us down, down this particular road. But Gavin touched on the point. This was about freedom and justice. Anybody want to advocate or suggest what what is justice in, in, in your lives? What what would be just? As I say, this this wasn't meant to be easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How come judging conduct based on this abstract individuals? <laughs> yes, to to an extent, the the. the Certainly referring to the principles, there must be a common set of principles to which we all agree. No one may have his actions interfered with except on the basis, basis of abstract rules defining it that is reasonably accepted by the consensus of those people. Yes. Both people must be able to have their case heard before yeah. judgment is made against them. Uh, okay, you, can, you can stop that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, B very close, uh, all, almost uh, verbatim from the book uh, <laughs> once again. And God, I wish I had your memory. I wouldn't be standing here with this piece of paper. <laughs> but from Hayek's point of view, and part of why I love what he wrote is he writes so cogently and, and so succinctly, he says it so, so briefly. Justice is those rules of conduct that equally limit the freedom of each so as to assure the same freedom to all. And once again, that's really, I suppose, a guiding principle is, is that Justice must, there, there must be some limit on your freedoms. And for libertarians, we've debated that to death, and we've come up with the, the non-aggression axiom, and, and uh, do as you would be done by, and, uh, sorry, yeah. what, what, what did you say? Uh, do no harm. Do, do, no, no, do no harm, we've got to all of those. I believe this is a, a more general statement of what we're seeking. At which point can we disagree with it? Right now? I, mean, I think it's wrong. I think it's a, it's a, it's a anomalous definition of freedom. Uh, because freedom is uh, a state of affairs. No, it's justice. He's defining justice here, not freedom. No, but you don't have to limit freedom in order to get justice. In the, in the, in the presence of freedom, there will be justice. I would argue, uh, we can go into that great length, but I'm just telling you I don't buy that premise that justice requires limiting freedom. Okay, um, and I, I can demonstrate it here with the famous libertarian technique. <laughs> but will it be justice? No, it will not be freedom if you punch me. That is the absence of the state of freedom. It, it's my freedom, not yours. No, but that's not it. No, no. Robinson Crusoe alone on the island doesn't have the presence or absence of freedom. Sure. Freedom arises when Friday arrives. Then there is or isn't a state of freedom. Um, well, Hayek says that. Yes. Well, he does, he does generally, but when it comes to justice, he, I think, uses his own Hayek himself like Mandela is not God, and then he actually forgets what he himself has said freedom means. Well, he is says, more Hayekian than Hayek, remember? Yes, yes, <laughs> indeed, yes indeed, we were getting to that. <laughs> he says that justice is those rules of conduct that equally limit the freedom of each, so as to assure the same freedom of all. He doesn't say how many of those rules of conduct we should have and what they should be. That that comes a little later mm -hmm. and, and really is... An example of the need to limit freedom. Mm -hmm. give, me, give me a correct... The whole law of tort. Sorry? The whole law of tort or deal it. How does it limit freedom? It makes you compensate people you harm through your intention no, or no, negative that's, acts. That's, that's a reaction to the breach of freedom. That is what you do when freedom has been violated. It's not itself the limit your ability to violate freedom. And, yeah. and how precisely yes, you, you define your ability when the freedom to violate it. That's precisely the point. So you're not free to violate freedom. Well, well that's, that's, that's an obvious contradiction in terms. Well, that's, that's, that's what he's saying is you're not free, essentially, to limit the freedom of another well, in order to not come to freedom. Limit freedom is just a mangling of language and concepts. Language is mangled. Well, <laughs> speak for yourself. Tell, tell, tell you what, we, we'll uh, post that one for, for later discussion. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good debate to have.
Yes, yeah, uh, it, it. yes it, it's kind of the, the purest libertarian debate of the early years, so to speak, when we were still trying to sort this out in our heads for ourselves. I obviously uh, haven't yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have, and I have the answers, and they're, they're almost perfect. Um, and, and I'll get to them in a few minutes. There, there are limits. Well, I'm just uh, tickled by the, by the by use of the justice, uh, the actual dictionary. Uh, uh, defines natural justice as something distinctly different from justice. Justice was a tax collected in the king's court. And when you talk in, 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 in American courts, in the judicial system, in the interest of justice, it means what's in the interest of, in the, interest of the king. Yeah. Uh, if you want to refer to natural justice, however, that would be something in the interest of fairness. And you can't even use equity because equity is, is once again, uh, what the king deems to be in his interest. So we're not really sure we use equity. equity. Yeah. I, I, I mm. had pretty much assumed that in this context we were not going to make any reference to uh, justice as applied to kings and governments. Uh, and so, so Mangling of words. Uh, the, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the justice that we refer to here is the justice we would desire to see inside the gates of libertarian, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. This was a quote uh, straight from the book, which I particularly enjoyed, and I, I put up in, in full for you from Walter Lippmann. In a free society, the state does not administer the affairs of men. It administers justice among men who conduct their own affairs. And yes, there's a, a, a couple of major concessions there, that a state does exist, and that there is a state that administers justice. These are all concessions in that quote, and certainly Hayek, and I, I will refer to it, in my opinion, is profoundly wrong on the subject of taxation, uh, for, for example. Um, but yeah, let, let, let's get there momentarily. Under what conditions may you apply coercion within the borders of libertarian? Is an important question. We do, well, I presume most of us agree that at some point or other coercion will be required within any society. Is there anybody who disagrees with that? That, that statement? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you just briefly expand if, why if you, you include if you include retaliation, if you call retaliation coercion, yes. Yeah. But if you define coercion as the Initiation of the, uh, from the bolt, from the blue initiation of violence or force, then the answer is no. There is no need for it ever to be limited. Well, co coercion is when one person forces another to do something against their will. I'm not really saying that. If that's your statement. definition, then fine. But yeah. it depends on how you define it. It yeah. depends on what you mean by the word. And that is how I define it. Okay. And would you believe. Uh, Leon echoes exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. We're not talking about the standard libertarian situation of uh, no initiation of coercion. That, that, that's easy. Yeah, okay. Inside our borders, no initiation of coercion. Um, do you agree? And away you go. And you go 50 feet inside, you turn to the woman that's sitting next to you in the car, and you smack her in the face because she said something rude to you as you went in. Now we have a problem inside the libertarian. And the question is, how do we deal with that issue of coercion inside the material? And certainly, uh, if I can find it on here, um, the coercion is only available for universal rules of just conduct. We've pretty much gone through the, the issues of justice uh, prior to this. From Hayek's perspective and within libertarian, there must be a single set of rules, conditions, laws under which uh, violations of freedom and justice would be dealt with and which would then become a, a means of effectively uh, dealing with that, that, that coercion, that violation uh, within the society. It does impose, and it does imply, that there will be some mechanism, in fact, for hunting down uh, uh, people who coerce, uh, for bringing them to trial, and for uh, exacting some kind of 
revenge, retaliation, uh, uh, I want to just interject retribution there, program. What you're saying is that we want to abide by the, the laws here. I struggle with the idea of uh, universal principles, because I think the whole idea of tort and the whole idea of common law <coughs> arise from Judaic, Western uh, ways of thought, which are only practiced by a small percentage of the world. So I guess my thesis is that within Oranya, it derives from consensus of people who want to live together here and say, in order for us to live together, these are the rules we live by. They may or not be related to you, they probably will be, but they're not necessarily imposed from some abstract universal uh, laws and principles. Then from when, whence do they arise? That is the question. From the consensus question. among the people who live there. Yeah. But, but then in that case, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Price, probably, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt, it, that becomes like a contractual agreement, yeah. which is absolutely no different uh, than any other agreement. And retribution or retaliation could be the rolling of the eyes of somebody you care deeply about. It doesn't have to be a violent coercion. Yeah, sure. Right, so there's different levels of this thing. Yeah, and I must say, I, I find the definitions a bit phrased in a way that's going to exclude the possibility of libertarianism and justice actually existing. But if I may say, the, the, the point you've articulated, the principle you've articulated is consensus. That's the law of general application. All you're saying is that Rania is a manifestation of it. So you've still got the general principle. Yeah. The universal <coughs> principle that you yourself articulated is consensus. Yes, pre precisely right. that point, and that, yes. that is what I was asking you, is you, you could sit everybody down in a room and say, you know, throw forward a bunch of suggestions, but what I believe is <coughs> from years of experience, from the observation of, of thousands of years of human behavior, and certainly I believe that you can distill certain long-run principles that would be the starting point for such a discussion. And he's very specific about that, is that you, you have to base your law, your freedom, your justice around the concept of long-run principles equally applicable to all which seek no particular outcome for any individual. Okay, there have to be general rules of effectively just conduct um, which will be applied in the long run. In other words, they, they, they won't be uh, modified. I, I didn't even bother to go through uh, Hayek's dis uh, differences between the, the nomos, or what he calls the <coughs> lawyer's law, or common law, the law that we have uh, derived by precedent over thousands of years, and what he calls the cosmos, not the taxes, or at least in this book anyway. Um, which is that set of rules that men develop in order to regulate the society in which they live. And that is the, the set of legislation, the legislation in the title law, legislation and, and liberty. And he's very dismissive of it, um, in, in essence. He says we should rather uh, seek to implement nomos, the natural law, if you are going to write legislation, do understand that it is purely there to tell you, you know, what width of sewerage pipe you're going to require for which number of houses. It's that sort of law that, 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 that you are, are writing in essentially. It's, it's rules of how to order your society in a reasonably efficient way, but it doesn't really touch upon freedom and justice in the long run. For that, he refers you to, to the nomos, to the, the common law, and to values which he says have survived by trial and error. And that was the, the very first thing that I, I was aware of re regarding Hayek from, from these sorts of meetings. Hayek puts great value upon old institutions, upon ancient institutions. Mm -hmm. He says you throw away that learning and experience at your risk. There are things to learn. Um, from kings and queens, from Catholic churches. Um, there's probably things even to learn from our uh, South African parliament. Be, be cautious not to throw away values which have survived for many years by trial and error. Now, I'd like to take just a brief diversion here to 
an article which I recommend to anybody, I have it here, you're welcome to borrow it. It's called The Anarchist Experience in Somalia, What Libertarians Need to Know. And what attracted me to it was that this quite well-researched article says that Somalia, which is generally held up as an example of complete failure of anarchy, <laughs> from around about, and it sure, Somalia has failed and continues to fail at, at different times. But from about 1990 to 2005, Somalia was without government, without colonial forces attempting to enforce governance upon them, and pretty much left to their own devices. Now, Somalians uh, a well-knit, close-knit society for over 2,000 years, have used a thing called SEER law. And if anybody knows better how to pronounce it, it's X-E-E-R. SEER law. They, they have used SEER law for 1,500 years. It is basically a, law, a, a, a common consensus between people within clans and between clans that covers most of Somalia. And the SEER law could practically be a libertarian constitution. Um, and, and in fact, now it is written down. It's based on, upon a book uh, written by an American who lived in Somalia for 20 years and wrote up in, in considerable detail the, the provisions of SEER law. It's completely based on property. It's probably good, good news for us. So um, it, it relates to you know, s stealing my... Uh, cattle and, and camels, to stealing my wife, to stealing my ideas, and to uh, stealing my life. So that is the, the point of view from, from which it approaches all problems. Stealing my husband. <laughs> well, that's generally considered better than wrong. Talking about property, I but, but, yes, to yeah, yes, 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 but, but yes, in, in, it, it approaches problems from the point of view of property. The pro, uh, Resolution of problems is handed over to the clan, the tribal elders of, of, of the clan. When there's an, an internal problem in the clan, then that clan's tribal elders will, will decide on it. I'll, I'll get to your obvious objection, which is who elects the no, elders. No, it's not an objection, it's a question. Oh, right. but, but anyway, uh, just, just let me get to that. If it's a, just, uh, a dispute between two clans, your son stole my daughter uh, from, from another clan, then both clans come together, and the two clans must agree on a uh, on an arbitration panel between them. And apparently, to everybody's surprise, this works fine. Everybody is very polite and convenient because the alternative is to have open bloodshed and and war uh, within the clan. And for me, one of the most important things is they have no concept of punishment and retribution. The only concept they have is of restitution. If you have done some kind of harm. Okay, and they, they've written this down and it's widely agreed between clans and to, with due respect to the woman here, um, if you kill somebody's wife, that's worth 100 camels to you. Um, and, and it bothers me about this whole system. It all seems to be the humans who are the property, the daughters and the sons and the wives. No, they're, 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 they're one element of, of, of they, they are regarded as property, but so, so are men. Men are absolutely regarded as property. Steal my son, you, you also have to reimburse me. Yeah. That's not very much different from the old Irish yeah. sort of legal system. Yeah, yeah. and, and from, the, 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 from, from the modern from the Western system. systems, like still modern Western legal systems, where the primary, primary remedy is damages, and where specific <coughs> performance is actually a discretionary remedy, it's very rarely an implement. Well, you know, we believe <laughs> as the West we have vast experience in, in law and justice, and we have the best. We have some of the worst, in my opinion. We have democracy, it really just doesn't work. We have <laughs> re retributive justice. Okay, we send you to prison, we flog you, we beat you, we inherited all of that from you know fairly savage people. Whereas in Somalia, they say, What is it worth to you? and you know, re restitution is, is the only uh, process for it. But uh, let, let me take that question up. Yeah, you just mentioned briefly, as you're saying, just basically, property, you mentioned ideas. Is that included in their law? So do you have like intellectual property rights? <laughs> I've got to admit I threw that one in uh, okay. on, on, on my, my own initiative. Uh, <laughs> but I, I presume that uh, if, you, if you find a better way of uh, you know, getting water out of the system and somebody comes over, I, I don't know. 
I, I, I will concede that point is that um, I don't know if the article runs to ideas. It just seemed like a good idea to put the time. <laughs> right. So I, I just really want to mention that rapidly in passing is that there are systems out there that are better than what we've currently got, in my opinion. Well, um, since you're a man, you think it's better. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the idea of doing somebody's property. Neither. It's a very unpleasant system. You are, don't you enjoy it? <laughs> <laughs> Moving it's on. It's in the West. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Sorry, was there a question there? Sorry, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. I just want to know on the... Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a Muslim country, mm -hmm. obviously, and I mean... Um, the right. North. Say again? In the North, not in the South. Yeah, uh, not it, in the it, South. it, it no. seems it's to be in the South. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the religion doesn't seem to be no. a factor no. 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 in Sierra Leone no. no. because it precedes Islam. Yeah, my apologies. Okay, so, okay, so, okay, I sort of like lost my train of thought there. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so, so basically it doesn't seem to, to influence, I mean, the, the legal, well, how can I say, like the, the punitive remedies that, that Islam prescribes doesn't seem to. Just a quick one, Francis, how much full time do I have? Very quick. 15 minutes. Okay. No. 1,000 camels for a wife. A thousand's worth, a camel's worth about $2,000. That's $200,000 for a wife. That's an expensive one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Two million rand, that's probably the standard of all settlement. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't this benefit the rich? Uh, I mean, how, how We're talking about Somalia. The last left rich guy mm -hmm. lived in Nigeria. Always rich and poor. You're maintaining this is a better system. No, 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 no. Sorry, I, I'm That's not ab absolutely not maintaining that. I'm, oh, oh, yes. I suppose I am in, in terms of Western justice. The idea of retribu uh, uh, restitution rather than uh, retribution, for example, I consider to be a better idea. Mm. Um, so, so yes, but so that's not that's Western justice. He, he, they, they have lots of bad stuff as, as well within their CL law, and, and yeah. probably uh, you know putting price on, on, on lives is one of them. But they have at least had the courage to say, yeah, we actually got to put a price on a life if we want our legal system to go forward. But be that as it may, um, do have a read of the article. It will change your outlook. We know on. that guy well. The other most he's in that case. I wrote this stuff about Somali, a married Somali woman. He's been in libertarian circles for youngs. You know his name? What's his name now? It doesn't matter if he's in that case, as long as he's recorded it accurately. Well, it really doesn't matter if he's in that case, if the ideas are not bad. It really doesn't. Sorry, yeah. Just a quick comment. We do actually put. Monetary value of lives in any case, like with accidents, uh, with some oh, yeah. guys, uh, actuaries will, will calculate the, the, the human cost of, of patent, patent living, etc. Et so it's not as if we don't actually do it. Fair, fair enough, but you will concede that we are forever saying in, in our particular society, who can value a human life? Let's completely ban all guns in America and we'll just save one particular human life. Yeah. I think the more interesting point is that societies to be cohesively very little in the night show rules to actually stay. Even bad rules can actually, but they're fewer than can create us. That's what's interesting about it. I swear he's not a paid uh, newborn <laughs> in the back. Yeah? Please, I think, I think you should invite comments at the end. I think you made a mistake to invite comments in the middle. That's an ironic comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'm disallowing that particular comment. <laughs> it's a process uh, control. Yes, comment. It, <laughs> it's your opinion. Yes, fair enough. Um, what we're getting onto here is the, the issue of principles. And that, that is really what uh, um, is, is at the core, is at the bedrock of. of Hyatt's view of law, legislation, and, and liberty. It's certainly what I've spent my, my time trying to, to extract a single consistent, well, not a single, but a set of consistent principles. Michael that, von Lotten. Hmm? Michael von Lotten. Ah, okay. <laughs> right. I didn't interrupt my train of thought at all. Uh, <laughs> 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 so let, let, let's get to defining a principle. I'll, I'll, I'll relieve you of that task. Oh boy. A principle describes how you want to behave. It doesn't say how you are going to behave. 
but simply how you ought to behave. And it is not changed by circumstances. It does not vary according to prevailing conditions. It does not take utility or the greatest good into account. Okay, that, that is critical to understand. It's not a short term, um, how can we get that contract or that tender awarded to us kind of a thing. It's a long term thing. And the consent axiom, in my opinion, is an example of a, a general principle that we have derived from past experience. And very simply, for those of you who don't know the consent axiom, it says that you may no, take no action against another human being without their full and informed consent. Mm. And it moves away from mm. things like the non-aggression principle, it certainly moves away from things like democracy, um, it, it by and large moves away from a legislative law as, as well. And it says that you may take no action against another human being without their full and informed consent. But of course there are dozens of grey areas around that, and you can take your pencils out now. Um, I refer you to libertarian.org.za, which we discuss some of the, 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 the many grey areas that will arrive from a, a statement as broad as that. Now, I, I'm a great believer in short, snappy sound bites, and I distilled that down to a four-word statement which is no action without consent. And that is just meant to remind you of what the consent axiom says. It is not the full statement of the principle by any means. Now, if you don't read the full statement of the principle, well, you can keep on expanding it outwards and, uh, and outwards until you're fully covered in informed and full and even consent means and how do you get consent from unconscious people and so on and so forth. You can keep on expanding this outward. But if you want a principle that you can offer to tourists standing at your libertarian gate that isn't going to require a three-day seminar in intricate libertarian law before you allow them in, well, if it's much longer than a sentence, then most people are not going to hang around long enough to say whether they're coming or going. They then will just simply say, well, that's a <coughs> unknown to me, I'm turning away, or, uh, yeah, I totally agree with that, and everything else is that. Um, but the, the, the point is to have a principle, not just one, perhaps. There will be others that will come under that or around it. <coughs> Excuse me. But for me, and for the libertarian that I aspire to, this would be pretty close to the founding, the founding axiom. What else do we have to say about it? If we are not guided by a body, this is higher. <coughs> if we are not guided by a body of coherent principles, the outcome is likely to be the su suppression of individual freedom. And I would believe, for example, in South Africa, we are not guided by a, a, a coherent set of principles, and our individual freedom is trampled upon again and again, because you can't put your hand up and say, no action without consent. You can't do that to me, I didn't consent. It applies almost immediately to things like taxation, for example, and thicker and all the other. Uh, thousand rubbish laws that we are <coughs> uh, exposed to. Now, one of Hayek's key points and one of Libertarian's key points is that most freedoms, or I'll probably dig myself into a hole here, most freedoms arise from the definition of your property and your right to use that property. Is that a reasonable statement? No. Because in parts of the world, the first people in North America don't understand the idea of private property. The Great Spirit has given us the whole continent to live and be in and hunt bison. And the whole idea of the, American, of the British coming in and saying, here's a boundary, and this is ours, they couldn't even understand the terms. That I, given. I, I assume the Great Spirit had property, which was all of it. Yes, exactly. So but no, nobody other than the Great Spirit could say, this is mine, and if you trap over that boundary, I'm going to adore you. And, and how did that turn out for them? 
Because <laughs> the, the people used pa, the settlers used pa to kill them. Just um, on, on that thing, the ranchers actually in the West also didn't have a very good concept of private property. And it was several decades, if not a hundred years plus, of them actually grazing over similar land before they finally came up with the idea of getting ranges and property and, and arranging that whole thing. So, I mean, to, yeah, to take your point is, hey, right here in the 21st century, there is vast confusion in most of our governmental systems about the, the nature and state of property. Okay, in the communist countries, it essentially is denied as, as an existing, as being in existence in places like England and America, um, you only hot, own half of your property. So the, the issue of property is still hugely debated and unclear in the, the, the world as we find it now. Hayek would say that in order to have a reasonable, free, and just society based on sound, long-run long principles, you must have a clear definition of property. And property cannot be alienated simply or easily by legislation or government or any other process. So he's, he's pretty insistent that once you have established your right to your property, it's as much a, belongs to you as does your life, which would also be interpreted as property. He calls them protected domains. See, for some other reason, he doesn't refer to the term property uh, as, as such. Um, and it, yeah, it makes sense in a way. Every, everybody in this world has a protected domain. In other words, an area of property or goods or livestock which is theirs and no, nobody else may impose upon that, that domain. A few brief words on, on democracy from, from the, the book as well. What today we call democratic government serves as a result of its construction, not the opinion of the majority, but the varied interests of a conglomerate of pressure groups who support the government must buy by the grant of special benefits simply because it cannot retain its supporters when it refuses to give them something it has the power to give. Does that sound at all familiar to South Africans in this room? Okay, no. How many people in this room believe in democracy and recommend it as a system of government? Hands up. Compared to what? Should we vote? <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, compared to what? Yeah, uh, uh, compared to, to uh, what I'm, I'm describing here, to the, the principles on which uh, the, the libertarian, the Trevor Watt mm -hmm. libertarian <laughs> might be based. Yeah, democracy, I see a democracy I needs... I definitely prefer democracy to Trevor's animal. Okay. Can, can I just get a well, show? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sorry, democracy can't be just defined as democracy. Yeah, exactly. Representative democracy. What kind of democracy? Democracy, democracy. 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 Yeah. as we have it today. No, because every country yes. calls themselves. Yeah. Yeah. They have it in yeah. Greece. Yeah. Yeah. Democracy, yeah. where yeah. in any yeah. uh, gathering, a majority of the persons present may limit the freedoms and rights of the minority. We better make it democracy as we have it today. Again, I don't really want to spend uh, too, too much time so on this one, but just a, a quick show of hands of those who are opposed to democracy as we have it today. As we have it today. Yeah, as we have it today. Okay, thank you. I, I, I'll go with that. The, the, In South Africa. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, isn't this surprising? This is the system for which the most powerful nations on earth will go to war in order to forcefully impose it on people like the Somalians, who have, in perhaps my humble opinion, a slightly better system. So, yeah. Is there... You're not the one who's owned. You're is, not the is, No, you're busy jumping here. Who? Oh. It's a system, Trevor. It's a system of slavery. Would you right. Let's, let's move on to our, our favorite topic for libertarians, which is taxation. Uh, Hayek has an opinion on this, and I unreservedly say that this rep represents a flaw in his otherwise admirable thinking, a, a concession to the status quo, a, um, a, an abrogation of everything he said before. In other words, he, you know, principles of general application, long-term run, etc., etc., all of those have to be 
question and query in order to put in place a system of taxation, in order to uh, put the state in place, in order to run the laws and rules and prisons and everything else that the state believes it, it needs. And that contradiction for me is why I have come to adopt the concept of anarchy rather than monarchy as, as my, my position is Minarchy just simply says it's, there's a couple of contradictions I'm prepared to just let slide by in order to accomplish the greater good. And that is an inconsistent position and history has shown that when you adopt an inconsistent position, sooner or later it comes back and bites you in the butt. So don't adopt inconsistent positions. Pike regards taxation as a special measure an exception to the rules of his nobles. He asks whether a burden that a majority is willing to bear may also be imposed on a minority unwilling to do, do so. And then gets into a long discussion as to how the total burden can be apportioned between different burdens and, uh, and under what conditions, etc., etc. Basically, the confused debate that leads to a set of tax legislation that they're high in just about every country in the world. So, yeah. Good news is, come in the gate, do you believe in taxation? Yes, right, push off. <laughs> <laughs> there is no taxation within our, our libertaria. There are, all, there are all sorts Even of... Even with consent? Yes, uh, yeah. uh, there, there is certainly... Um, the definition of tax compliance. Well, in fact, let, let's, let's just try that for, for, for lunch. Because there's, there's, well, this is good. I'm, I'm absolutely there. <laughs> what does this mean for the future? Well, in Hayek, in my opinions, the great society will not be achieved through democracy, which is merely a means of selecting the most popular group to shoulder the burden of the organization of the state. It will not come about through politics. Sorry, Sean. It will not come about through force or directed action or supreme effort. Sorry to all the Americans. <laughs> the achievement of the great society depends on persuading the general populace to adopt the negative laws of just conduct as the basis of order within a society. It requires men of reason to have faith in the power of spontaneous orders to bring about positive results, even where this is not the intention. It requires men of action to do less. <laughs> it requires men of wisdom to acknowledge their ignorance, their inability to know the future. It requires men and women for whom peace, freedom, and justice are their primary values. Am I on? Finished. Yes. lunch waiting for us outside, which is the case of lunch that you pay for the teas and your wine for yeah? You can mention, I tried to arrange a tour for 2 o'clock, so uh, yeah. I said didn't go on a, on a tour yesterday. Okay, there's a tour at 2 o'clock. I want to ask the guys if some of you can maybe take some of these chairs.